Hi everyone, this is Alan McKay. Welcome to episode 139. I'm speaking with Ovi Nadoku, a storyboard artist for Sony Pictures Animation, as well as Disney, Laika, DreamWorks, and more. Let's dive in. Welcome to the Alan McKay Podcast. Alan is an Emmy Award-winning visual effects artist and mentor to many leading industry experts. Listen in as Alan talks with other industry leaders in film, video games, and visual effects about their experience, lessons, and methodology. Alan will teach you pivotal advice to fast-track your career, better your skills, and reach your ultimate dream job. Check out the latest episodes on alanmckay.com. Okay, welcome to a new episode. I'm really excited for this one. Uh, I really like chatting with Ovi, really talented guy who's put out a lot of amazing work. Ovi's worked for Disney as well as Sony Pictures Animation, Leica, DreamWorks, Hasbro, Warner Brothers, and many more. So he typically works as a storyboard artist. He's worked on a lot of different projects from Paranorman to Caroline, Norm of the North, and put out a lot of custom storybooks as well in his form for Shrek, Puss in Boots, and other things like that. So I really like chatting with him. It's really cool. Actually, I've had a lot of guests who are in Portland, Oregon uh, lately, which has been kind of cool to see a lot of people who aren't specifically in LA getting to work on a lot of different projects and and that sort of thing. So I think it's kind of cool that there is a, a bit of diversity in terms of locations and the fact that a lot of us can work remotely and successfully. So I think that's really cool. We get into that a little bit in this episode as well as a lot of Ovi's artwork, his process, um, how he got to where he is today. Um, I think this episode is really insightful and a lot of fun. At the same time, a couple of quick things I just wanted to mention. One is that right now I'm in LA. I'm going to be going to Vegas in a couple of days to hang out and a kind of business retreat that I've organized with a couple of directors at Lucasfilm and a couple other different places in the US and Canada. So it's going to be fun just to get a few individuals together to do a bit of brainstorming and just kind of hang out, have fun and see what happens from it. But we thought it'd be really cool to do a lot of live streams of that week and all the things that we're doing, some of the stuff that we're discussing. So if you aren't currently following me on social media, I'd suggest doing so. I'm going to leave some links in the show notes, but I'd suggest doing so specifically because I think there's going to be a lot of really valuable content that I'm going to be doing some live streams about, and it mightn't be available after that. So it's a chance to kind of get in there and get access to a lot of stuff that is exclusive and only available for a little bit of time. So there'll be a chance to you know enjoy that while it's uh, fresh. Um, so I think the easiest way sounds kind of pretentious, but the easiest way is Google me um, just because that way Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, I think those three are probably the ones that I'm more than likely to stream on. And this won't just be me. This will be uh, the other people that I've gotten together as well, which I'll announce soon. But yeah, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. And um, yeah, just in general, I think there's going to be a lot of really great content coming out from that. In addition, next week, I'm going to be putting out some free training that I've been working really hard on and I'm really excited to get out. This is something that I've had um, a lot of people inside of my mentorship suggesting different ideas and, and trying to vote on what we think would be the really coolest stuff to do. So I'm going to be putting that out um, next week. So keep an eye out for that. And finally, I'm going to be opening up registration for my mentorship for 2018 uh, shortly as well. So there's a lot of really big announcements, things that are coming up in the next week or so. So keep an eye out. In the meantime, I'm really excited to dive right into this episode. So without further ado, here's Ovi Nadoku. Just to start out, again, thanks for taking the time to do this. And do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is Ovi Nadilku. I currently live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a freelance visual development, character design, and story artist. So I kind of bounce around here and there, depending on uh, where the job comes up and where it leads me. That's awesome. And I guess like for you, we were just talking about it a minute ago, but like, how did you get started? I mean, did you always want to do art as a kid or um, did you kind of like discover it later on uh, or how did you kind of fall into it? Um, yeah, I think like most kids, you know, you grow up, um, just always doodling and drawing. And it wasn't until I'd say, um, about my senior year in high school where I started to realize that I was probably a little better than most kids. And, uh, at the same time, I had a, a couple of other buddies that were interested in doing comic books and, um, 
illustration as well. So we kind of uh, grouped together and uh, learned a lot from each other and, you know, started to really advance and, and realize that, um, you know, there's, there was a career in this, you know, if we really sort of put our minds to it. So cool. um, I'd say, I'd say in high school, yeah, is where we kind of, uh, where I, where I realized that you can, you know, do this for a living, you know? So mm -hmm. um, I just kind of went from there and started to research, um, you know, how to go about it and uh, what kind of job you can have. I think it, uh, originally I wanted to do like books and comic books mm -hmm. and um, illustration. And um, because that all involves uh, visual storytelling, I, it eventually led me to um, storyboarding kind of by accident, though, because I wasn't really looking to get into animation at first. It was just um, um, I sort of saw it as uh, um, a way to learn and a stepping stone towards kind of doing my own books and my own comic books and stuff like that. But um, I eventually went because once I got into it, I, I, I realized so much of it was uh, similar to doing doing uh, visual visual storytelling and comic books so uh i ended up just really loving it and continuing in in it and uh still doing it to this day yeah that's awesome that's really cool and i guess when you're trying to initially look for that career and, and uh research i mean were there a lot of resources at the time when you're kind of trying to discover this or uh no not really i mean we had the internet back then but it's not you what would, it is you would today, alter vista you know? not google <laughs> yeah this was back in um 1990 1999 mm -hmm. i want to say 98 99 yeah um so it was yeah it was basically just either word of mouth or reading stuff in books and magazines you know yeah. um and you would you would kind of uh, I, I used to go to uh, conventions as well and so you would get a chance to talk to some of the pros and they would you know give you the they were they were basically the the google search of the industry back then you know like you got a <laughs> lot of inside scoop uh q a from them you know so think, that was good yeah it's kind of cool though i mean i feel like in a way like the internet is such a great resource but in some ways especially when it comes to conventions things like that it definitely has ruined that because before you would have to go somewhere to kind of immerse yourself in it and these days it's like eh, i'll skip it this year and i'll just you know get the updates each day and you know on the right. web so um less and less people go and you know obviously there's not as much contact um but yeah i mean for you like who are some of the people that you would try and meet up with at, at the events? Yeah, um, I actually am kind of gu guilty of that as well. I, I, I haven't been to a convention in quite a bit. I think the mm -hmm. last one I did was a CTN Expo down in LA. Mm -hmm. And that was um, three or, about three years ago now. So um, I think for what, I, for like what I'm doing personally um, and just sort of my, my family and my lifestyle, like it, it's kind of hard for me to get out, you know? Yeah. And like you said, because of social media and whatnot, you kind of, you know, get the vibe of it and mm -hmm. you can still do a lot online that you can do basically uh, that, I, that I would do in, in conventions. But um, it's still nice to go there in person, you know, obviously, but yeah. um, I just have to always weigh that against like what my schedule is like and what's going on in, in the house, you know. That's right. And you originally from Portland or where you from? So um, I pretty much grew up in L.A., um, Oh, well, I shouldn't say LA. I grew up mostly in California. Um, we uh, we came here from Romania back when I was one, I think, mm -hmm. and then we sort of migrated from New York to Chicago, Arizona, LA, and then up to Sacramento. I kind of spent most of my childhood in Sacramento, right? Um, and then went to the Academy of Art College in San Francisco for a couple of years. Oh, cool. Um, after right after high school, and then from there I got a uh, job offer from Warner Brothers. So I moved down to LA and uh, was sort of studio hopping for about six years while right. I was there before and I moved up to Portland, Oregon. That's cool. And I'm just kind of curious, like um, with once you graduated from uh, Academy, of Univer Academy of Art, sorry, University, um, was it pretty easy or straightforward for you to go right into the industry or was it kind of, you know, a little bit of um, that struggle trying to find the right place? And Yeah, not, not really for me. Um, Actually, I, I never really, I never graduated from art school. <laughs> right. Uh, I I planned to, but um, about halfway into it, I got a, I got, like I said, I got a job offer from Warner Brothers, and uh, it was, you know, I had to make a choice to either continue to pay tuition or yeah, right, get further get in job, debt. You know, so. <laughs> uh, but actually, I when I went to art school, I I kind of went into it um, with not really wanting to get a degree per se, just to get like a portfolio bill in my education. 
Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of went about it a little differently, I think, than maybe some of the other students. Like I just wanted to take, um, like the norm I think was that most students would take like two, three art classes and like two academic classes, you know, each semester to sort of balance things out just because the, the art classes had such a he heavy workload. You're right. But um, I would just take like all art classes, you know, because in my mind I was like, well, I'm, if you I'm just trying to build a portfolio, then why would I spend all this money on a on an English class, you know, or yeah. whatever, what have you. And I think that these days, I mean, I guess you got a question why specifically you're doing it. I mean, if you're going to study to be a doctor, then yeah, it makes sense. But um, right. I was just talking with someone early today about this, but, you know, obviously your portfolio is everything because it shows what you can do. And there's no piece of paper out there that's really going to qualify you um, to a client or a director or to anyone if um, other than your portfolio, because that's yeah, exactly. what mm -hmm. they want to you know, see that you can uh, do for them. Right. So, yeah, I feel I, I feel exactly the same way. I mean, um, you know, somebody can have zero education in, in art school, they, you know, but if they just learn to observe life and draw and practice, and, and they know kind of, you know, build a portfolio, and it looks good, and that's all they really care about, you know, they can kind of learn some of the tricks of the trade on mm -hmm. the job, you know, that doesn't take very long, I think, to learn, um, just to kind of get her be able to get around and, and sort of learn some of the lingo. But yeah um at the end of the day yeah it's just it's all about getting that portfolio built you know um and that's what i've been telling um some kids that uh that i know that are learning learning art and trying to get into the business and i keep telling them you know like think of it more of like a trade school you know like you're you're trying to build um a portfolio and build your craft you know and you're, you're not necessarily going to just a, a general ed you know mm -hmm. university where you know just kind of float around for who knows how long until you figure out what you want to do, you know? Yeah, exactly. Most people end up going to do psychology until they figure out, oh, okay, now I want to be a lawyer, so I'll get yeah. further in debt and yeah, it's just <laughs> ten, a, it's, ten more years. I mean, it's it's fine to get, you know, that secondary education, but it's it's, it's really expensive, you know. If you can afford it, go go for it. But <laughs> yeah, so I guess in the the first couple of years of your career, I mean, what were the typical projects that you were working on? Um, let's see. So when I first started, I actually um. I got a job at Warner Brothers and it was a pretty unique situation because um, I actually um, met. So I went to the the convention at in Oakland, the comic book convention there in Oakland, looking for um, comic book work. And one of my friends was telling me that Warner Brothers had a booth there and that I should go show my portfolio. And I was kind of hesitant. I was like, well, you know, I, I don't really know much about animation. You know, I didn't I I. I was kind of naive about it. I thought you would just be an animator, you know, or in-betweener. That's mm -hmm. about all I, about as much as I knew about it. And uh, so I, I, I didn't really want to do it, but he eventually convinced me to just go ahead and try. So I went up and showed him my work and it was actually um, Sean McLaughlin, the producer of, uh, associate producer of Batman, the animated series. Oh, great. And um, he liked my work enough to, to give me a test. And uh, of course I failed the test, but <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, it was, it was kind of like doing a bunch of turns, you know, and like uh, a lot of orthographic views and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of technical stuff. And uh, I, I just wasn't up to speed to, to try and, you know, get into that off the bat. But uh, what he did do was show my work to their um, development department there. And um, they really liked it. And so they, they, they flew me down and it was pretty surreal. It was kind of crazy. Um, and kind of went over a bunch of shows that they were developing at the time. And so they put me into the development department, um, you know, which is great. I mean, it was even, it was, you know, yeah, it's definitely uh, not in between you stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, it was, it was pretty surreal experience. And I kind of took it for granted too, cause I wasn't really aware of like how things worked, you know, in the studio mm -hmm. structure and just sort of the politics of everything and all that. And so I was just kind of like, Oh, okay. You know, I'll just work on this stuff for, you know, a few months and then I'll go back to, trying to get back into books and comics or whatnot, you know, illustration. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, while I was doing that, you know, I started to really love it and, and realize that, yeah, you can do uh, character work and storytelling, you know, through beat boards and things like that and visual development. So um, it just kind of fit into what I was doing already, you know, and I, that's something that I didn't really, mm -hmm. I didn't really know too much about how it worked in animation, you know, so once I, once I got into it and started to see that, you know, all the similarities that I, I really started to love it and started to learn 
a lot on the job. You know, I would, I would spend pretty much every night for like the first year and a half there after everybody went home, just like Xeroxing all these, you know, <laughs> uh, model sheets and amazing pieces of art, you know, everywhere and like studying and trying to learn as much as I can, you know, so it was, it was very much um, a university, so to speak, after hours for me. Right. And that's cool, though. I mean, do you find that many other people would kind of have that, I'll say, obsession with um, with doing that? Because again, I always feel like there's the people who go in, they do what they're told and, you know, they're kind of yeah. doing what um, they think is acceptable. But yeah, obviously, there's some of us who really go the extra mile and we usually right usually yeah. you guys are the ones who yeah i don't i don't know i kind of felt like um um i mean i've always had a drive to like get as, as good as i can you know i've always had a drive to learn as much as i could possibly can and get better mm-hmm. um but i think a lot of it too was that i kind of felt um i felt um i don't know like a little bit like a fish out of water like I didn't know a lot of the lingo, you know, I didn't know a lot of like the terminology and, um, you know, these guys were all, a lot of these people, you know, um, were all, uh, seasoned, you know, animation people. And so I kind of felt like, um, I had a lot to prove, you know, so I kind of wore that right. a little bit on my shoulder and, 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 and felt like, you know, I, I really got to, um, you know, excel as fast mm-hmm. as I can, you know, in order to sort of blend in and, you know, fit in and, and get better at it, you know, um, so it was, it was a little bit of that and a little bit of, you know, just, you know, I, I, I'm always looking to get better whenever, whenever I can. So cool. uh, when you're around all this amazing artwork everywhere, you know, you just, you get really inspired. At least I do. And um, yeah. I felt like, you know, this is, this is right here at my fingertips. So why not? This is, you know, again, this is pre Google search, you know, and now you can just type in, you know, Batman animated model sheets and, you know, and you get hundreds of model sheets. <laughs> yeah. I feel like we're kind of spoiled so these days. It's like, you know, this stuff was proprietary you know, it was like it was in the studio walls you know like nobody yeah. really sees a lot of this stuff you know so it was uh it was kind of like a little bit of you know going into a willy wonka's chocolate factory you know so to speak cool no i so like that I, I i tried to take advantage of it as, as much as i could and um yeah no I, I think it's really cool and i guess like around that like for you storyboarding obviously it's kind of more something you you stumbled into but for you now obviously being very seasoned in what you're doing um what do you think for you is like what makes you really passionate about storyboarding is it having more creative input and having more of a closer relationship with the director or whoever you're working with or what specifically um i think it's just for for me what it comes down to is just telling a story visually i've always enjoyed you know doing that whether it's through storyboarding or through um, uh, sequential art like comic books or through picture books you know where it's more of like um, just a spot illustration to sort of try and convey a message or a story through that. Um, it's just the art of communicating a story through through pictures. You know, that's always intrigued me, and I've always uh, enjoyed doing. So um, when I when I started getting more, actually, when I started, I was doing a lot more visual development and character design, and mm-hmm. then I eventually um, uh, asked people to, you know, give me a chance doing storyboards. Cause I would, I would always do like comic books on the side, you know, I was always learning about storytelling and, and whatnot. And so I felt like it's, it, it wouldn't be a too big of a jump to sort of just learn some of the principles of storyboarding and, and some, some of the technicalities, you know, um, cause I feel like it translates, it, it sort of can translate over pretty well. Mm-hmm. So I felt, I felt pretty confident that I could, I could do that as well, you know? And so I eventually, um, started asking around to sort of give me, you know, maybe a test or something. And then they would, they would do that. And I would try, and you know, they would say, well, here's what you need to do here. And here's how, you know, this differs from comic books and whatnot. And so once I, once I learned that it was, it felt like pretty natural to me, you know, it wasn't something that, um, I really struggled with, I guess. It was just more about, uh, fine, fine tuning a lot of the stuff. And even right. now today, I'm, I'm always learning um, new things because, you know, like, you know, storyboarding has really has really changed and evolved from the days of pinning up, you know, yeah, uh, 50 boards, 50 storyboards to sort of uh, tell the story of a sequence, you know, to complete a sequence. Now it's like you can get up into the thousands where you it almost feels like sometimes you're animating some of this, some of the shots, you know, <laughs> to kind of convey to the directors of like, you know, the, the whole the the feeling of what you're trying to say you know as opposed to just saying you know this happens here and this happens there and you know of yeah. it's, it's it's not as loose and vague as it used to be i think it's cool sometimes when you do get some directors who are very visual and 
you're right not not to the extent where you're essentially making a flip book but um right. you know when you are like you know i think of the matrix and a few other projects where they've essentially created like a graphic novel to illustrate exactly what they want before they even begin to uh, go into pre-production and yeah you know i think place like that like i think it'd be you a lot of people would be a kid in a candy store kind of getting to um go down that journey with them mm. yeah it's i would say too that like there's there's a balance too you know you i i i know storyboard artist that like you know um forget the guy's name but uh he was a freelance guy on, on one of the last films i worked at at Leica, and the guy was like literally animating his board it was wow. it was completely absurd but um you know i'm like i can't i can't do that because i'm not an animator you know uh, i don't want to be that's not what i do and mm. um when I, when I do my boards, I try and, I try and limit the posing and stuff like that as much as possible to, to tell the story, but not get so like, uh, locked in, absorbed into like mm -hmm. the animation part of it, you know, I right. just feel like that's not my job, you know, yep. um, my job is to sort of compose a shot and make sure the story point is communicated in that, you know, the expression and the emotion of the character is, is, is communicated um, to the animators and to, uh, the team, you know, mm -hmm. but there's, you know, there's, there's a point where you gotta like say, okay, this is, this is getting too much, you know? It's... Yeah. I'm with you. And, um, yeah, I'm just curious, like, obviously you had a pretty long history with Laika as well. So, I mean, how did that come to be, I guess, like, well, I guess specifically, why did you move to Portland in the first place? Oh yeah. So, um, I actually, um, when I was living in LA, I, I met my wife there, um, and she was visiting, uh, from, she was from Oregon, she was from Portland, Oregon, and she was visiting down there. And so we kind of, uh, headed off and everything. And we, you know, obviously we realized, well, we, we we're long distance. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we, after we got married, she moved down there for, uh, I think two or three years until we had our first child. And then at that point, um, a few things happened. I, I finished up a, a project at Sony and we were having our first child. And I also told her, that we would eventually move back to Portland because I actually really liked it up here too. I just yeah, it's beautiful. I was was always trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to make a living up here and, and all that stuff. So um, I did some research and I found out that there was a couple of animation studios up here. You know, one of them was Will Vinton and the, a couple of little game studios here and there. And so I was like, you know, um, technology was getting kind of up to speed back then, and I sort of realized that uh, I could probably make it work, you know, because of the cost of living. Mm to live up here at the time wasn't, was pretty, you know, was pretty cheap compared to, compared to LA. So I just took a chance and said, you know, let's just move up and see what happens. And, and so we did. And, um, around that same time, um, Henry Selleck was, um, had just moved up here to start working on a, on a core line for, uh, like a studios, which wasn't, it wasn't named like a studios yet. It was still Will Vins. I think they were in the process of mm -hmm. changing the name and you know all the buyout and whatnot back then um and so he uh, he heard that i was moving up here and so i got a i got a call from him and you know he asked me to come in and show my work and um yeah it was pretty it's was, it was pretty awesome you know we went in and it was a very small team we were we were all working on uh, that short film moon girl mm -hmm. and um from there it just i basically um uh, went on to to the next next project after that which was Coraline, um and then just uh went on from project to project you know afterwards right that's great and uh, yeah i'm just kind of curious like do you get a, any resistance when you're kind of pitching working remote or is it most people especially um kind of where you're you're at in kind of the pipeline i mean is it pretty feasible to be remotely based um i'd say it was a little harder back when i was first when i first started doing it from here um just because you know like internet connection and all that wasn't as fast as it, it is now, you know, you weren't able to do like a lot of the video conferencing yeah. and stuff like that. And so you basically had to um, communicate over the phone what you wanted or email and then send off that work and then hear back from them. And I think most of my freelance work actually back then was um, like character design work. So it's not as, um, I think it's, it's, it's not as involved as, story, as storyboarding is. Um, where you kind of need a more like one-on-one, -on -one, you know, um, in-room mm -hmm. experience to sort of communicate and, and pitch your boards and stuff like that, you know. Um, so 
I was mostly doing character work and that was, that was fine. You know, there was its limitations, but as, as technology got better and, and people got more comfortable, you know, uh, freelancing studios got more comfortable freelancing and yeah, the, the, um, the pushback from that kind of went away, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say it just kind of slowly evolved into what it is now and, and got better and better, you know, year by year. Cool. I like that. And yeah. what do you think is some of your favorite projects to date? Obviously you've worked on a lot. Uh, my favorite projects to date, I'd say, um, I really, you know, Kubo's, Kubo was great. It was fun, really fun working on that. Um, I'd say, you know, all the, all the Leica projects were really fun to work on. Um, Coraline was, was very cool, you know, getting to see all that, uh, all the stop motion sets and, and whatnot being mm -hmm. built. That was sort of my first experience with stop motion. So, uh, that was very cool. And then I recently just finished up on, um, Mary Poppins returns. And that was a really, a really cool experience. You know, cool. Um, Who was that for? So that was, for, that's for Disney. And I think the, the movie comes out this December, I think Christmas time. Cool. Nice. That's really cool. Yeah. And uh, what about your personal projects? I mean, again, you've, uh, I, I think it's really cool that you have been able to kind of go for what you originally set out to do and begin to create a lot of your own books and things like that too. So, I mean, what's your experience been like with that? Yeah, it's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, um, I'd say my, right now, my main focus aside from animation is doing uh, picture books, just because I really love illustrating. Like when I first started uh, to get into get interested in doing this as a profession, you know, I always wanted to be uh, a book artist, comic book or illustration, you know, so uh, it's kind of come around full circle now to where um, I can do that as well. And, and I really enjoy I really enjoy illustrating, so that's that's why I I sort of feel that um, picture books are are perfect avenue for that because I can storytell, but I, I can I can do most of it through pictures, you know, as opposed to mm -hmm. writing. I kind of write because I have to, not because I not because I I really enjoy it that much, you know. <laughs> so um, the less words, the better for me, I'd say. Gotcha. That's why I I enjoy doing picture books. Yeah. No, that's cool. Like, um, how do you? Well, how did you kind of initially get started with that? I mean, I'm sure you know, the difference between getting greenlit on a project is it's kind of, you know, you're, you're coming on board for it, but for your own personal stuff, I mean, I'm sure there's always going to be um, a bit of a, you know, I've got the talent and I've got an idea of what I want to do, but how do I actually bring it to reality, especially, you know, the publishing side and everything else. But for you, like, was that pretty straightforward or was it a bit of a learning curve or? Um, yes and no, it was um, just because I, I've always been into it and I've always kind of read up on it spent my time doing it outside of you know animation work i was more or less familiar with how it worked you know when i first started um uh, doing books it was mostly for comics you know so i would um, go to conventions and get work that way and then also um, made um made contacts you know with with image comics and then i eventually pitched a um, comic book series that i wanted to do through them called pigtail and uh, we worked on that for for a couple of years. And so after that, uh, I had a pretty good understanding of like the publishing world, even though it wasn't picture books. Um, right. again, I felt like it was something that I can, that I can learn, you know, sort of the, the ins and out of, of, of that world, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started to, um, just research, um, the picture book industry as well. And I had a few friends that, you know, kind of led me in the right direction and pointed me to a few uh, resources and, and, and things to read, books to read about it and all that. And um, I originally sent out some query letters to get an agent because I, I realized that a lot of people, um, illustrators and, and authors get most of their work through agencies, you know. Um, so I quickly learned that, you know, it's, I should probably get a, an agent if I want to mm -hmm. keep this sustained, you know. Um, and so I did, and uh, um, I got my first book, which was um, um, my first authored book, which is called it's called Just Like Daddy, um, done through uh, Pow Publishing, and that was back in 2015. Cool. But prior to that, I did, um, like I said, I did some comic book work, and then I did a short story for Flight Comics through Kazu Kibushi mm -hmm. uh, Flight Series. And, and yeah, I think my blog and my illustrations too eventually um, drew the attention of some of the editors um, uh, from the, the picture book industry. And so I did a, a few uh, tie-ins as well, like Shrek and Puss and Boots and whatnot. Yeah. So with those ones, like, what was that like doing, like, instead of dealing with your own IP, I mean, to deal with 
some very well-known IP. I mean, was right. there much of a different vibe for you? or? Um, yes and no, because one of the criteria that I had for doing these books was that I would do it in my style. Great. Um, so it wasn't like, um, a book where they're like, you have to, you know, use these model sheets and, and draw the, the characters yeah. exactly as they look, you know, that's, that's the type of thing that I'm not really interested in, probably not really good at either. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that was, that's always been one of my criteria for doing any kind of like tie in books is that I, I get to kind of just draw it in my own style. And, and thankfully, like the reason they wanted me to do those books was because of my work as well. You know, they wanted me to sort of interpret those characters through my through my uh, through my style and um, uh, taste, you know. That's cool. Yeah, um, yeah, and just to segue for a second, but mm-hmm. um, you were talking earlier on about, um, I guess, having that kind of pushing yourself a lot more than others to, you know, stay late to uh, to really uh, kind of implement yourself into like everything that's going on, and I guess right now, like these days you know, having more of your own rhythm, being at home, having family, everything else. I mean, I'm just kind of curious, like what your typical routine is. I mean, obviously running a business from home and having family, everything else around, like for you, you know, do you still try and uh, do a lot of uh, personal work in terms of not your commercial personal work, but just your personal sketches, things like that? Do you have um, a lot of typical habits that, you know, you have to kind of keep you pretty structured day to day or how do you typically work? Yeah, um, it's it's becoming increasingly harder to <laughs> harder to do that, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, I still I still try and um, you know I usually not always, but usually try and get up and before I start any of my um, uh, commercial work, I try and at least sketch in my sketchbook um, for at least you know ten or fifteen minutes. You know, at least do maybe like a couple of pages full of doodles and um, just to kind of warm up that way. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I try and read as much as I can, even though I, I find myself not having a lot of time. And then after the kids go to bed, um, I usually, you know, try and spend time with my wife. Cause I, it's obviously really the most important thing, you know, is to keep the relationship with her and my family, mm-hmm. uh, alive and thriving. But, um, you know, if they're, if, if she's off doing, you know, she likes to play music. And so if she's off doing her music stuff and playing piano, then I'll, I'll sit down and try and like come up with some stories, you know, um, and some ideas, uh, after hours, you know, after everybody's gone to bed, but, um, yeah, it becomes, it becomes harder when your life gets busy, you know, um, when you're spending a lot of your time, um, doing work all day and then, you know, everybody needs your attention uh, afterwards. So, um, my thing is if, if I have like a creative bug that I need to, that I need to, uh, fulfill, you know, I'll, I'll try and get up early. I try and get up maybe a few hours early and then, you know, while everybody's sleeping and it's still peaceful and calm around the house, I'll, I'll get a lot of my, my thoughts and personal work done that way, you know? Cool. I'm just curious, what's early for you? Early for me would be, um, around 6 a.m. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I usually, I usually, well, let's see about five or six. It depends. Mm-hmm. I usually get up around seven anyway, but yeah, I try and get up like at least a couple hours or an hour early. Um, and then if it's something that I really, uh, um, I'm trying to get worked out, you know, like some personal work I, I want to get jotted down and worked out, then I'll spend, you know, my breaks and my lunchtime doing that as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, it's important to always, uh, keep that alive, you know? And I think yeah. that's, um, how I actually get, you know, a lot more work too, you know, it's, it's really helped in, in other areas, you know, um, I can bounce back between, Viz dev and character design and storyboarding depending on the project but also now you know i can do um picture books and comics you know and so it's 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 really good to sort of i'd say be well versed if you're going to be a freelance artist Mm -hmm. to be able to do um other things because you know if if, even if you're a great let's say character designer you know once a project dries up and if there's not anything immediately available after that then you know um you, you kind of have to scramble for work and and sort of hope for the best and you know start yeah getting your portfolio out there again but if you have a few different clients you know one of them is for storyboarding one of his character or viz dev or even a book you know you can always sort of tap into those different different places you know when um when things get scarce no i think it's really great advice and i guess like my final question would just be about your latest project one green mouse so that comes out april 24th Oh yeah. So, uh, yeah, one gray mouse comes out April 24th and, um, yeah, it's my latest, um, uh, author illustrated book. Um, 
I've been, it's actually something that I started working on uh, probably about five years ago. And then I kind of put it on the shelf and um, I've just, just came back to it this year. And it's, it's, it's been really, really, really nice to finally get that one done. Cause that was something that I've, I've been uh, fussing over for a while. And, um, and um, I didn't really have a, an ending for it that I was, that I was happy with. And so I think once that got resolved over the last year, then um, we kind of ran with it. One word, and, mousetrap. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> mousetrap. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's um it's a book about hope and um you know the willingness to believe that life can change for the better. Um I think uh you know I I, I love a lot of the and I, I do them myself concept books that um are fun and, and cute, you know, and enduring. Um but there was there was something I, I kind of really wanted to say with this book, you know, to um encourage especially especially, you know, some of the younger younger readers to always, you know, hope for the best. And, um, even in trials and, and when life gets tough, you know, uh, that you should always, always, always have hope and never, never lose it because that's, I think really important, even in, you know, uh, in times where it seems like, you know, things are, are hopeless. Um, I think that's an important message for mm-hmm. kids and adults, you know, no, that's great. It's really awesome. Well, again, man, like this has been really great. Um, where would people go to find you online? Oh, so they can go to um, my website, which is just my name, ovinadelku.com. Mm-hmm. Um, I also have Instagram and Tumblr. Uh, uh, my Instagram is ovinadelku. And yeah, uh, you can pretty much link from my website, though, to any one of those. Cool. And I'll definitely videos. leave links to all that in the show notes, too. But uh, yeah, man, this has really been really awesome. So again, I appreciate you taking time to, to chat and go over everything. Oh, anytime. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thanks again for Ovi taking the time out to chat and share a lot of his insights. Uh, I had a blast doing this episode. And if you want to check out the show notes, go to alanmckay.com slash 139, 139, and you'll be able to check out all of the key insights that Ovi shared over this episode, a lot of key quotes, other things like that, as well as links to other resources and everything else we talked about as well as I'll link to all the social media that I mentioned that I'll be doing some of the live streams on in the next couple of days. So that being said, I'll be back next episode with Catherine Mullen, who is the animation supervisor at MPC. She's worked on everything from currently Dumbo, Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man Tell No Tales, Monster Trucks, Spectre, Furious 7, Wrath of the Titans, X-Men First Class, Maleficent, Guardians of the Galaxy, Hunger Games, Happy Feet, Harry Potter. She's worked on a lot of stuff. And uh, I loved the episode with her. It was really cool um, getting to chat about her career history as well as a lot of advice she gives to people who want to work at MPC and want to get into the industry. Uh, We get into a lot of stuff. It was really fun. So that episode is up next. Until then, rock on. (laughs) 